Turn in your Bibles, please, to Galatians. We are we have finished the Gospel according to John and 72 sermons, walking through that book together as a church. It's online. You can look at look at that if you'd like to. We're right now we're in a series this summer called The Fruit of the Spirit. So what I want to do is I want to read from Galatians chapter 5. Um, and then when Romans uh, chapter 5, excuse me, Galatians chapter 5, and then Romans 5 as well. Um, so I'm just going to read Galatians. We're going to look at Romans in a minute. But let me read Galatians. Let's put things in context. We like to keep things in context here uh, as we go even through uh, portions of Scripture. So hear the word of the Lord. Galatians chapter 5. Big numbers, of uh, the chapters, small numbers are the verses. Chapter 5, Galatians, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like that. Decided to stop writing (laughs) as a list. And I warn you, and I warned you before, that those who do such things, continually live practicing those things, do not, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such things there are no law, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. So, kids, if you're here and you want to go to Children's Church, you're welcome to go right now. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the back. Um, If you don't own a Bible, please take it with you. It's our gift to you. Galatians chapter 5 is where we will be. So we we began this study three weeks ago, and we're calling it Fruit of the Spirit, Internal Gospel Growth. Internal Gospel Growth. We did that on purpose. Paul, in his letter to the Galatian church, teaches us that God the Holy Spirit is working to produce fruit that grows in us, in the heart, in the inner man or woman, as we apply to our lives the truth of the gospel. As we apply in our lives the truth of the gospel. If you remember from the introduction uh, in the book of Galatians, there was folks who were called Judaizers. Uh, The Judaizers had infiltrated this young church with a false gospel. And the false gospel had to do with being right with God, reconciling to God. Um, And they said that a person is justified, reconciled to God, um, made right with God. He or she must have faith in Christ plus adherence to the Mosaic law plus adherence to the Mosaic law. And Paul says we are justified by faith alone. So before we go any further, let me give you a very important uh, uh, understanding of the word justification. It's an important biblical word. It's also very important in the book of Galatia. Justification, Paul uses, means that we have before God been forgiven of our sins, declared not guilty, Okay, declared not guilty before the the cosmic throne of God the judge and being found righteous. It's not enough simply to be forgiven of our sins. We need a righteousness that is greater and surpasses our own righteousness. Right? Our righteousness is polluted by all kinds of sins and imperfection. The way to remember justification is looking at it as a a two-sided coin. On the one side, we have been declared forgiven, not guilty. And on the other side, we have been given a righteousness that is not our own. It's a foreign or alien righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For our sake, this is the great, if you don't have this verse memorized or at least somewhere in your brain, put it there. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, for our sake, that means for our benefit, God the Father made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. Our sins were credited to Jesus' 
who became sin, who bore our sin, who, who died as our substitute, bearing the wrath we deserve in our place, and then his righteousness was credited to us, because we don't have any. So that when God looks upon you and me in Christ, he doesn't see our sin, but sees Christ's perfection. That God delights in us, Christians, trusting in Christ through the Son, because he sees his son's perfection that's been imputed or credited to our accounts. And it's very important that you understand that, therefore, because that's true, to add anything, to add anything to the work of Christ, to add anything to the work of Christ that justifies us, is to deny the sufficiency of the cross. It is an affront to God. All your moral doings to bring it before God as a way to be justified, made right with God, is but filthy rags, uh, the, the psalmist tells us. Adding to the work and the sufficiency of Christ, who gave us his righteousness, who died for our sins, is what Paul calls in the book of Galatia, living under the law. Okay? Under the law. Living under the law is not a reference to law obeying, it's a reference to law relying Okay, following me? Chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. No one does it but Jesus, right? Now it is evident, Paul says, that no one is justified, made right, declared righteous, not forgi uh, forgiven of our sins, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous shall live by faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. False teachers were teaching faith plus law abiding or law obeying. And that makes you right before God. And to think we can win the approval of God, to think we can win uh, the acceptance and forgiveness and love of God through our moral performance or even through our own obedience of giving, coming to church, reading the Bible, is living under the law. Or, as I said before, relying on the law to be made right with God. It's called Phariseeism. But we as Christians believe in Christ, trust in Christ, rely on Christ who fulfilled the law for us. We, by the Spirit's work in us, supernaturally want to delight in God. We want to resemble and know the one who died for us and rose for us out of love and grace. And how do we do that? By following and obeying the commands of Christ. Pastor Ricky last week preached on love, and he said what he said was right. This is what he said. Our obedience is not our means of justification, but a result of receiving justification. If we obtain our righteousness is only through faith alone, through Christ alone. Galatians 2. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith. In Christ, not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So Paul attacks these Judaizers in chapters 2 through 4 with good and right and sound theology. And we get to chapter 5, and Paul loves to do this. He loves to teach theology, and then he teaches practicality and how to live that theology out in his book. So 2 through 4, we have a biography, chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. We have good theology, and then we have the practicality of living out that theology in, in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, if you look at Galatians, he reminds the church that their freedom that they're justified by faith alone through Christ alone, is not a license to do sin, rebel against God, right? Paul challenges the church, remain free, Re remain trusting and relying upon grace, relying on Christ alone, who set us free from sin, from guilt, and the curse of the law, but don't use your freedom as a license to sin but love one another, Galatians 5. It was Charles Spurgeon, who's the prince of preachers. He's been called prince of preachers. He said this, What is God's law now? Question mark. 
Some men hold God's law like a rod in terror over Christians, and they say, if you sin, you'll be punished for it. It is not so. The law is under a Christian. He's not talking about under the law like Paul is, but listen. He said, the law is under a Christian. It is for him to walk on, to be his guide, his rule, his pattern. We're not under law, but under grace. Law is the road which guides us, not the rod which drives us, nor the spirit which actuates or compels us. The law is good and excellent if we keep it in its place. So we said, what Paul is saying in Galatians 5, is that when the gospel of grace and mercy comes into a heart, a regenerated heart, it gives us the desire to love, obey, and honor, and worship, and follow Jesus. The moral standard, the revealed will of God, because of the gospel, grace alone by faith alone, gives us a trajectory to freely pursue the holiness of God because we know that when we fail and we do, it's covered. There's no fear. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we are free to follow Christ and obey Christ and to love him and to love others. Paul said it clearly, 1 Corinthians 9, though he's not under the law, I'm not free from God's law because I am under Christ's law. What's the law of Christ? Love the Lord thy God and love others. It's about love. See, though he's not under the law, he's trying to get right with God by obeying the law. Paul's not under that law. But he's freed now to see the beauty of God's law as fulfilled in Christ and submit to, it in a way, submit to it in a way so that it shows love of God and love for others. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Follow my commands. But family, you have to understand, it's not a means of justification. That is by grace alone, through faith alone. The gospel transforms our hearts to want to follow Christ. And therefore, joy is a byproduct of the gospel. Joy is a byproduct of the gospel. The gospel transforms us by love, not rebellion and self-effort, and makes our obedience to Christ a joy. The gospel is a byproduct of the joy. In Luke chapter 2, the angels were... You know the story. The angels were, uh, excuse me, the shepherds were out in the field watching the flock by night. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, the shepherds were filled with fear. It goes on to say, the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a, a Savior, Christ the Lord. See, joy is the work of the Spirit in our hearts. It is the number two or the second thing on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And family, joy cannot, joy will not. Joy cannot and joy will not happen as a result of living under the law as a way to please and honor God. You will not have joy. You will not have joy. Joy is when we are walking and being led in the Spirit, pressing in and applying the truth of the gospel, justification by faith alone. That will produce the fruit of the Spirit, and we're talking about joy today. So remember this. We said this in the introduction. Uh, Ricky mentioned it last week. You may hear it every week for 10 weeks. There's a major difference between a morally restrained heart a heart that is law-relying, relying on the law to be justified and trying to do what's right because it's restraining the heart. There's a major difference between that morally restrained heart and a supernatural renewed heart that's resting solely in the gospel, being justified by faith alone through Christ alone. A morally restrained heart, a supernatural renewed heart, there's a huge difference between the two. And that's what Paul is talking about in chapter 5, verse 22. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit is... He doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. It's singular now, singular verb, because the fruit is a cluster. A cluster of grapes. I was going to bring a cluster of grapes today, and I, I forgot. You all know what a cluster of grapes look like anyway. So the fruit grow together. It's not about your temperament. Some people are just joyous kind of a happy kind of people. The fruit of the Spirit must be together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. All those things grow together. They may grow at different speeds. You may be growing in a spirit, in a fruit of the spirit, and one of the fruit may be more than the other, but if one's growing and one is not, it's not the fruit of the spirit. It's your temperament. 
They grow together. That's what Paul is saying. The fruit, singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Okay? So, how does the Spirit produce the fruit of joy in our life? Let's look at it. First of all, you need to know there's a war going on. There is a war going on for your joy. Second thing is, we need to know that the way of joy. How do we get joy? And finally, the wonder. We'll end in the wonder in joy. And how to sustain joy in a life that is up and down, right? So number one, the war against joy. Look with me at verse 16. There's a war going on against your joy. There's a war going on against all the fruit of the Spirit. Not just joy, all of them. There's a war going on. Verse 16. I'm, but I say, Paul writes, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The Spirit longs to bring the beauty and glory of Christ, to show forth his incalculable worth, and to conform us in the image of Christ. That's what the Spirit desires. Verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. Anybody who's been a Christian for 30 seconds knows that there are two desires in one's heart, right? There's one of the flesh, one of the spirit. And it says right here, they're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. See, the spirit comes and desires in our hearts what we want to do, but we don't always do it. Amen? Everybody shake your head. Yeah, there's a lot of things I want to do I don't do. <laughs> but... If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So being led by the Spirit keeps us from going back under the law, saying that we are now relying upon the law in order to be justified, which is only by faith alone. So if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 19, he gives us the works of the flesh. Let me read them quickly. There are four categories. Sexual sin, sacred, social, and substance. Sexual, sacred, social, and substance. Number one. Sexual, verse 19, sexual immorality, porneia, it is the just death draw of, 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 of sin. It talks about marriage, sex outside of marriage, uh, that's what sexual immorality is. There's impurity, it's unnatural sex, sensuality is uncontrolled sexuality, that's the sexual part. Verse 20, we get to the sacred, idolatry and sorcery. It's about uh, you know, the worship of false idols and, and sorcery, pagan religious practices. Verse 20b and 21, we get the social aspects of the flesh and how the flesh acts and, and destroys relationships. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, dissension, divisions, envy. All right? So you have, you have sexual, sacred, social, and then substance. The last thing is drunkenness and orgies. Paul puts them together because it's not just drunkenness, but it's sexual drunkenness and orgies. That's why they're together. It has to do with substance abuse. Now, before you and I were born anew of the Spirit of God, before God planted his DNA in our hearts by way of the Holy Spirit, the only thing that ruled in our life was the flesh. It reigned and ruled alone and unopposed. Okay? Some of you have in your Bible sinful nature. I don't like that translation. It's the word sarx, S-A-R-X. It means the flesh. It's that inward disposition to, to resist God, to, to go and do what we want to do. It, it's a rebellion and a self-centeredness that, that, that is in our hearts desiring to run from God. It's not a dual identity. We don't have dual identities. If you're a child of God, you have an identity. It's called the child of God. That's your identity. We're a new creation in Christ. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You belong to Jesus, you belong to Jesus, that's your identity. But it is an inward disposition, the flesh is an inward part of us that has been programmed and conditioned, now listen, programmed and conditioned to live apart from God all our lives. We were doing that before we got saved, before we came to faith, before the Spirit of God renewed us. We are programmed and conditioned to be apart from God. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he needs to reprogram us. That's why Paul says, be renewed, by the, be, be renewed by the, of your mind in chapter 12. I think it says it in that. Let me see. Yeah, chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We need to renew our mind, the Holy Spirit, by the word of God, teaching us new things, reprogramming. Some of us need our brains washed. <laughs> right? We got old tapes and garbage. Our bodies, impulses, We've just given over to them for so many years. And now the Holy Spirit comes in and Paul says, you've been 
Bought with the price, glorify God with your body. So the Spirit of God is, is teaching us to, to, to be programmed in a way that honors Christ. We have the mind of Christ, the Scripture says. And that's what, ju- that's what sanctification really is all about, being transformed in the image of Christ. It is the work of the Spirit reprogramming our brain and conditioning us with self-control to honor God with our bodies. But the flesh wants to go back under the law. The motivational system of moral performance as a system of identity and approach to God. It's the old, look how well I'm doing, you're not doing so good as, as I am. And we got to diligently fight against that. Verse 17. See, in verse 17 it says the word desires, yeah, desires of the flesh, desires of the spirit, desires of the flesh. The word desire in that passage is the Greek word epithumeo. It means an over desire. It, 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 it has a preposition, a, a, a prefix to it, I mean, epithemeo, and it's an ordinate over-desire. That's how the flesh works. You see, the flesh gives us an over-desire. It's not just wanting to do evil. It is wanting to take things that are good and make them evil. So things like worship, the flesh drags it in, and, we, and it brings us into idolatry. We start worshiping false things. Uh, It takes things like sex in the context of marriage between one man and one woman and pulls it into bad things like sexual immorality. The flesh takes things that are good like financial success and family, reading your Bible, prayer, all those things, and sucks them into a system of beliefs that our moral performance is somehow going to get us right with God, that our moral performance is the basis of our identity with God and our salvation. And and family, if, if we try to work our way, we try to do our way into sanctification, uh, excuse me, justification, being made right with God by faith alone through grace alone. If we do our way into that, into it, we, we do our deeds, we do our salvation, and we're working our way into it, what we're doing is working our way into meaning in life, working our way into being loved and accepted of God, and it will, it will, it will create an over-desire for that thing. Because the thing that, that I'm justified by, if it's not God, whether it's family, whether it's success, whether it's my looks, or whatever it may be, we're going to want it more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Epithemeo, over desire. But if we walk in the Spirit, a life supernaturally controlled by the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit will grow in us supernaturally. But we have to apply, we, we have to apply the gospel to our already justified hearts. I'm loved by grace and grace alone. And if there's anything that robs us of this joy, there's a lot of, there's a few things, but it's sin. It's living constantly in contrary to the will of God. David was a man who was loved by God, who had a deep relationship with God. Yet he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Yet he commissioned the murder of her husband, Uriah. And then we read in Psalm 51, he says, Restore to me. The joy of your salvation. He had, lost, he, he had lost that sense of delight in his relationship with God. He says this in Psalm 50, excuse me, 32 about his sin. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of the summer. There's no joy in that. He had disobeyed the law and it robbed himself of the God-centered joy. David followed his fleshly sexual desires, as we all do from time to time, our flesh. And it was at great personal cost. That's one thing we don't talk about is, is the loss of joy when we rebel and sin and live in sin. Why is that? Because joy fundamentally, family, Christian joy fundamentally is the enjoyment of God. It is the communion with him. So our flesh glorifies, adores, and yearns for all kinds of creative things. But the Holy Spirit desires and yearns to make Christ known. And, and, and to adore Jesus. To see the beauty and the greatness of Christ. So sin obviously disrupts that communion and the enjoyment of his presence, his glory. The, f- the flesh ultimately rejects the free gift of God. 
the righteousness and salvation by Christ alone. The deeds of the flesh are always the result, listen, of the lack of trust in the grace and mercy and kindness of God. The works of the flesh are desire to protect myself, to guard myself, and to live in my own self-effort through my own self-salvation. And let me tell you, family, there will be no joy in that. There's a war going on. Look at the way of joy. One thing you need to know about joy is it's an inter- it is an internal work of the heart that is given to us externally. Okay? It is, I'll say it again, lasting joy comes internally to our hearts from an external source. You cannot, in your own strength and ability, produce it. It's a divine attribute that's been given to us. Jesus made it very clear in John 17, as he's praying this high priestly prayer to his father, moments before being arrested, he says, while I was with them, Father, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except Judas, the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, Father, and these things I speak, the word I've spoken in the world, talking about his disciples, that they may have my joy. See that? My joy fulfilled in them. We've been through John before. We know in John 15 and 17 that Jesus experienced great joy by giving glory to the Father, his, his, his beauty and majesty that belonged to the Father, in abiding in the Father's love and doing what the Father commands. And ultimately going to the cross. That's what he said in John 17. You got the glory of God and joy. Joy can be described as this. This is important. Joy is said to be great delight caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Joy is a source or cause of keen pleasure or delight. Something or someone greatly valued and appreciated. Doesn't that make sense? And the greatest display of the beauty and incalculable worth of God in this world is the cross. On the cross. On the cross we see the magnificent proclamation of God's immeasurable value. His worth, his holiness, his justice, his love and grace. So with that in mind, we talk about joy. We could say joy is what we find ultimately satisfying, that in which we greatly value. The the love and union we have with Christ makes it possible to share Christ's joy because Christ reveals his glory, his beauty, his value above all earthly things. John Piper was right. Joy was designed by God as the deepest way to reflect his value. Joy is a, she says, joy is a spontaneous response to what you treasure, end quote. What do you treasure? When we experience the abounding love and we obediently treasure and cherish and relish in the glory of God, his value, his, his incalculable worth, the byproduct will be abiding joy. Joy is the instinctive reaction. Joy is the instinctive reaction to the immeasurable worth of God. That's why joy is based, listen, you may not have heard this before, ultimate Christian joy, the Bible talks about joy, is not subject, subjective feelings, but objective truth. Joy is, Is based on objective reality. It's anchored in the faith. Believing. 1 Peter 1.8. I have it on the screen. Peter writes, though you have not seen him, right into the scattered churches, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you what? Believed in him and rejoice with joy. In inexpressible joy filled with glory. We equate happiness and joy as being the same thing. It's not. It's not only this different idea, but it's also a different source. Happiness is about what's happening. And it's okay to be happy. I told the first service, my wife and I sat out in the back, back deck last night. It was late at night, and I, I, I made the steak. It must have been that thick. I was happy right on the grill, man. It was so good. 
It was so good. I know you're hungry. I hope some of you ate already. I haven't, so I'm hungry too. So it's okay. But joy, the divine work of joy, is not hindered by our circumstances. You could be sorrowful and sad and still have joy. Why? Because joy, true joy, is the delight in God and who he is and not the things of this world. So if you have joy in God, if you experience joy in who he is, then you can actually have joy even in the midst of hardship, trials, and difficulties because God doesn't change like circumstances. And you're like, all right, so there's a, there's a, there's a hailstorm in my house, bust all the windows in my car, hit the tree, the lightning fell on the house, the big hole, it's raining and pouring in my house, and I'm supposed to jump up and say, oh, what great joy fills my heart. You might have to up your meds or an Academy Award because you're just kidding yourself. But I do believe biblical joy, biblical joy in, in the midst of trials is understanding that there's an underlying reality that we are loved by God. We are forgiven by God. We are children of God. God does nothing that has not have a purpose and a plan in all that God does and God allows. That kind of joy. Look at Romans 5. Turn to Romans if you have a Bible. Therefore, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace, this grace in which we stand. And we what? Rejoice in the hope, in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love, his love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So Paul begins by saying you've been justified by faith. And the main mark of, of characteristic of being justified by faith, he says, is joy. Verse 2, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. We rejoice in our suffering. Look down at verse 11. But we also rejoice in God. Rejoicing going on. Rejoicing going on. It's not about circumstances, even in the midst of suffering. So if you look at Romans 5, let's just walk through this really quickly here. Justified by, we're justified by faith. We have peace with God. We're going to talk about that next week. The enmity and the hostility between us and God has been put away at the cross. He's holy. We're sinful. There's enmity. There, there is an estrangement. That has taken place. But through the Lord Jesus Christ, the past act of his justification on the cross where he died for our sins, forgiven, and we are the imputed righteousness, we now have a standing and a permanent peace with God. Number two, look what it says. Because we're justified, we have peace, we have access. See what it says? We have access to God by faith, and my standing before God is by grace alone. You see that? In fact, the original language, it, it is a... Um, it's completed in the past and never needs to be repeated. It's a permanent standing. Standing, Paul writes, expresses or is a posture, I should say, of triumphantness. There, there's a triumph, there's an immovability. We're standing. Footing is firm in the gospel. We don't come cowering before God. We don't come crawling to God. By the work of Christ, we can stand because the righteousness of Christ has been in and credited to us. And the word access is a great word. It actually, in the original language, it's two words. It's to bring and it's face. To bring face to face. It's to bring someone face to face. And what Paul is saying is because we've been justified by faith alone, through Christ alone, that we now are ushered into royalty. <laughs> We're ushered into royalty, perfect tense, permanent. We have access. Now, some of you may know the story and some of you may not, but there's an Old Testament story of a woman. Her name is Esther, a Jewish woman. By the good providence of God, Esther becomes queen in a foreign land. Okay? And Esther is, by the providence of God, this queen and a plot is um, devised to annihilate all the Jews in the land. And the king, she's the queen, the king inadvertently signs a decree declaring that to be so. But Mordecai, Esther's uncle, pleads with her, listen, you got to go to the king. you got to stop this. you got to stop this holocaust. 
Esther's frightened, and the reason is no one can enter into, when the king is sitting on his throne, no one can enter into his throne like that, unannounced and without permission. Esther finally comes to the point of going. See, the king, the king had to, when she went into his presence, the king had to put down his scepter. That means everything is good. If he didn't, she would die. Even the queen would be killed. Esther 4. I will go to the king, Esther says, even though it's against the law. If I perish, I perish. She puts on her royal robes draped in glory and beauty, and she stands in the inner court holding a breath, I'm sure. And the king was so moved by, by her beauty and her glory and her boldness, he stretches forth the scepter and guarantees her access into the kingdom, into the king's presence. Family, you and I cannot stand before the king of kings in our own righteousness. You and I cannot stand before a holy God in our imperfections. We are not granted access. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We, we are clothed and Jesus Christ lays down, opens, or, or lay, lays open his scepter and extends to us because of the sufficiency of the cross. We now have access to the throne. So, we, we sang earlier, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Psalm 1611, we read it before a lot of you were out there, but the opening psalm that we read for worship was Psalm 16. Listen. You, the psalmist says, will make known to me the path of life. In your presence, the scepter entering in, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures evermore. You see, our hope rests not on circumstances, but upon his promises, upon his power. We can have joy and the hope of his glory. Hope in the Bible is not like I'm hoping that the Yankees win. They lost five straight. I'm hoping they win today. That's a different hope. The hope in the Bible is a confident expectation and desire for something good will happen because God said so. So Paul goes from Romans 3.23, we've fallen short of his glory, to Romans 5, we're able to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Joy is not a spontaneous response to some temporary pleasure. It is not dependent on circumstances. Listen, joy is based in rejoicing in the eternal reality and love and identity we have in Christ. The ability to make great cheer of the gospel. And now we get to wonder. If there's anything I want you to follow here, and capture is, is the wonder. The wonder, the wonder of God's love and grace causes the Christian to enter into a joy that is rooted in salvation and nourished in our relationship with God through the gospel. Let me say it again. The wonder of God's love and grace causes the believer to enter into a joy that is rooted in salvation and nourish in their relationship with God through the gospel. Seventy-two men were sent out in the gospel of Luke to go preach the gospel. They all came back and said, We have great joy, Lord. You won't believe this, but the demons are even subject to your name. It says they were rejoicing. And then Jesus says, Do not rejoice in that, that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Rejoice in your salvation. He's not discouraging rejoicing. What he's saying is, where is the source of, is it, is it, your, is it what you do? Is it your confidence? Is it even in ministry? Let it be in me and me alone. The gladness of our salvation overflows with real satisfaction in Christ and a deep contentment, listen, a deep contentment that only Christ can give us. It's not temperament. It, it's the Holy Spirit producing work in us, rejoicing in Christ has done for us, and we are genuinely and obviously glad to belong to Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 13, I got it up on the screen, Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch in Basidia. They go and preach the gospel. The Jews reject them. 
Paul turns to the Gentiles and proclaims the gospel. Verse 47, it says, The Gentiles heard the gospel. They began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. There's an outward expression. Now, sometimes we can be joyful and be quiet. I get that. But the joy is rooted in the reality and recognition that the dominion of evil has been broken through the power of the gospel. And through Christ, he defeats, defeats sin, death, and hell. And no longer did it have a claim on us. And the constant reflection, the constant wonder of this reality will effectively arouse and sustain joy of our hearts even in the midst of difficulties. Why? Again, joy is grounded in God. Circumstances change, he doesn't. Now, let me get real personal for a minute, okay? Don't raise your hand, but let me get real personal for a minute. How you see, how you see, how you perceive God to be affects whether or not you will have joy. God-centered joy, okay? How you perceive, I mean, if God is a pouting, hopeless, gloomy God, right, you won't have joy. Imagine being around Father's Day, right? We don't want to be, we don't have dads that are just gloomy and depressed and hopeless all the time. You can't enjoy that. But if God is joyful in himself, then we too can have joy in him. Again, Piper's right. The foundation for our joy is the joy of God. God delights in his glory. God delights in his glory. God is delights in rescuing us from sin, death, and hell so that we can enjoy his glory. God is all about glory, and we are glory starved, which is why we are searching for joy. Everyone is. Everyone is. We're not created simply in the Imago Dei for, for, uh, to, to reflect him, but we're actually created in the Imago Dei, the image and likeness of God, with the capacity for joy. Do you know that we're commanded to have joy? Psalm, Isaiah 25. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Psalm 31. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love. See the root? See the cause? Psalm 5. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always. Here's the problem. Here's the problem, family. Sometimes not problem just with joy, but it's the problem of the pursuit of joy. Sometimes we are in the pursuit of joy and it's the flesh that's pursuing joy. And we try to get circumstances, certain things to make us happy, make us joyful. And we are then going back under the law, trying to get self-justification, trying to justify our lives. And we run after things, we run after things. And the problem is we are seeking joy in idols. We are seeking joy in false saviors, expecting things and other things and people to give us what only God can give us. That's his joy. C.S. Lewis, in a famous book, a sermon, Weight of Glory, said this. If we consider the unblushing, unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. He says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased, end quote. See, we forget. As Christians, we're justified by faith. And the reason why we don't have joy because we're justified by faith is because we lost the wonder. We are forgotten and lost the wonder of our salvation and pursue joy in idols and false saviors. That's why the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Remember, Dr. Tim Keller, pastor of New York City, actually retiring, tells a story about a couple who went away for a long weekend and invited another couple to stay. And the couple that stayed while they were away, 
uh, was there about four or five days, and the couple came home and saw the other couple, and the couple that was staying there said, oh, by the way, we opened up all your mail while you were away, and we paid your bills. Hmm. How do you respond? You don't know. What kind of bill did they pay? What was the size of the debt? It could have been posted due, $2.48. At that point, you're like, well, okay, thanks. And by the way, don't touch my mail next time. But, he writes, what if it was the IRS hmm, that finally found out where you lived and it was a major bill from back taxes and you know that you have absolutely no way, no resources to pay the debt. In other words, until you know the size of the bill and the size of the debt, you don't know whether to say thank you very much or he says, fall at, uh, fall at their feet as dead, saying, you saved me. You don't know how grateful or joyful you should be until you know how bad and awful it was. Family will lose the wonder. The only debt that can sink you and sink me is the debt that we owe to God. When we keep pressing the gospel into our hearts that we are wicked and sinful and without hope on our own, yet we are loved, redeemed, forgiven, accepted, not on our own works, but the works of Christ given to us by faith alone, we can have joy. Even in the midst of suffering. Because the ultimate debt was paid. And Romans says there is nothing, nothing can separate us of the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. Nothing. That will keep our head and heart on joy that will last forever. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you cannot bear fruit. You can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I love this, as the Father loves, as the Father loves the eternal Son, so I have loved you in that same love. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things, verse 11, chapter 15, John, these things I have spoken to you that my joy, Jesus is saying, may be in you and that your joy may be full. You see, happiness is based on circumstances. Biblical joy is based on and in God who never changes. The Holy Spirit will not, the Holy Spirit will not produce the fruit of joy on dead and disconnected branches. We must dwell in Christ and in the gospel. When there's intimacy and organic unity to Christ, the fruit of joy will be a natural, or, or should I say, a supernatural work of the Spirit the wonder of our rescue. There's one other place in John, we'll end with this, where Jesus talks about joy. We talked about 15, we talked about John 17, but there's a place in the gospel according to John in chapter 16. If you remember, Jesus is hours before his crucifixion, and uh, Judas already gave him up, and, 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 he's, and he's going to get arrested. Hours before his crucifixion, he turns to his disciples, trying to comfort them, because it's going to be hard. The next few hours are going to be hard. The next couple of days are going to be really hard. And he's comforting his disciples. And he reminds them over and over how difficult it's going to be. And then in John 16, 21, hours before he's delivered over to uh, the, the, the authorities, he says this. John 16, 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Jesus is teaching them and identifying with the woman. Now today, babies are born, and I'm sure there's a lot of pain. I don't know, never had one. But I know there's epidurals, I know there's medication. In those days, 2,000 years ago, a woman went through severe pain and suffering to the point of possible death and maybe death, and a lot of people died in childbirth. So, so let's put that, just keep that in context for the moment. The only way for a woman to give birth to a new baby and the joy of new life was to go through the suffering and the pain and the vulnerability of childbirth. Jesus Christ is saying, this is what's going to happen to me as I go to the cross. 
bear the wrath you deserve on the cross. I am like the woman who's giving birth to joy and to new life by going through all the suffering in your place, the pain in your place, the vulnerability in your place, absorbing wrath in your place. That's what's going to happen. And the other side is joy. Here's how you develop joy. You you press in the gospel, the truth of the gospel. You look at Jesus. You look and say, Jesus, your joy was snuffed out as you died on the cross, separation from the Father so that I could have access to the Father and joy eternally. You experience, Lord, suffering and pain and vulnerability so that I can have life. That's how joy comes. You look at all that Christ has done for you and the wonder produces a sense of how loved you are and it inflicts a joy in you that makes anything that comes our way possible to handle. Because of Christ, our joy is in God alone. Don't lose the wonder. Alistair Begg. I'll end with this story. The band can come up, and you all will just sit there one more minute. Give me one minute and tell you a story. Alistair Begg, he's a pastor in Ohio. He's a Scottish. You might have heard him on the radio. He's a great pastor. He's a great preacher. So Alistair Begg was at a conference once, and Alistair Begg was given a note at a conference. And when he got back to his office and he opened up the note, this is what it said. Dear Alistair Begg, a friend was suffering through brain cancer and its treatments. His relationship with Jesus was such that a nurse that was involved with his treatment wrote a critical comment on his chart. It said this, Mr. X is inappropriately joyful. She writes, since then the writer of that note said, it now has become my goal to be inappropriately joyful. Life can be hard, I know. Sadness, sorrow is real. But let looks to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And the wonder of his love and the wonder of his grace. All that he had did to redeem us eternally. And let us rest in the unfailing mercy and grace and love of God. Let's get and be reminded and remind each other in community. And gather and deal with joy in community. Let us, let us together wonder of the gospel. And let that be the product or the byproduct will be joy. Father, Father, thank you for your word. Father, we don't, we don't want to just say gospel and not contemplate it deeply and see our imperfections and Christ's perfections and see our sin. Lord, we want to look at the cross and see how desperately wicked and hopeless we are and then look back at the cross and see how loved and valued and treasured we are. Lord, we know those things, the wonder of the gospel will be used of the Spirit to produce joy. Help us, Father, as we worship you now, as we continue to worship you in song. In Jesus' name.